the fireside chat, The Future is Secure, with Azadeh Moaveni and moderator Matt Abbott. Hi, good morning. My name is Matt Abbott. I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's my honor to welcome Azadeh Moaveni, the author of Guest House for Young Widows Among the Women of ISIS, which was just released last week. You have a chance to pick up your copy of the book at the side table um, that was included on the New York Times Most Anticipated Titles for September list. Um, I read it over the weekend. It's a fantastic read, so I highly recommend it. Um, in your book, you track 13 women who left their homes to go to the Islamic State. And they're among the thousands of women who made this journey. First, can you tell us what inspired you to write this book? Um, thank you, Matt. And first of all, thank you um, to the Council on Global Affairs for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I was drawn to this topic because I've covered the Middle East most of my professional life as a journalist. Um, I was a correspondent. Um, you know, from the late 1990s, um, and had charted the impact that conflict has on the lives of women and girls in the course um, of, of my work covering the region. I've worked across Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iran, Iraq. Um, so the challenges that women and girls faced um, in, in these various societies that I covered, and it's a region that I'm from myself, I'm from Iran, um, is something that, you know, I had, had reported for years. Um, when ISIS unfolded in 2013, 2014, I was living in the UK. Um, and I was just astonished to see young people from London, from the city where I lived, where I taught young people getting up and going to join this group that had nothing seemingly to do with them. Um, and I was stunned to see the Middle East conflict spill out kind of beyond the borders of the region. Um, it had, you know, it's a region mired in conflict, but it's largely been contained there. Um, and I was really dismayed to see the coverage in Europe um, of the young people who went to join ISIS because it was as though they had suddenly, and many of them were young girls, I mean, they were in their teens when they were recruited or groomed, um, and I was stunned to see them sort of excommunicated. They were suddenly not British or French or German anymore. They were just, you know, barbarians. Um, and to me, you know, their stories or their motivations were intelligible. Um, I had kind of lived in the West as, as a young woman from a Muslim family. I had covered the region um, and, and sort of seen the arc of challenges that women and girls faced. And I could sort of see it, but I felt that nothing was really getting through in the headlines about what might really motivate women. So I wanted to make the story intelligible. Tell us more about these 13 women, though. What were their motivations for leaving their homelands and traveling to Iraq and Syria? So I think... A really important theme, and one that I try and draw out in the book, is that ISIS um, recruited very sophisticatedly and particularly across societies, and it did this really stunningly well. Um, I feel like you know, some of the motivations um, can be intelligible, especially for the theme that everyone's been discussing today. I think for young Muslim people in Europe, a lot of the ISIS messaging, especially in the early years, was around the idea um, that they were not included as European citizens, especially if they were visibly religious. Um, there was a lot of talk uh, about racism and discrimination, uh, killings of Muslim civilians from Afghanistan to, to, to the Middle East. Um, it was very political messaging, and it preyed on this idea that Western Muslims didn't fit. There was really no place for them, especially in Europe. Um, and that if they would come and join this utopian society in the Middle East, they could live there peacefully. They could be pious as women, they could uh, participate in society but still be quite conservative, that they would be included there in ways that they weren't at home. Um, so I think that really resonated for a lot of young women, and especially um, I write about three schoolgirls um, from, from East London who went. I think you know, reading their social media accounts and their tweets. I mean, that's what they were talking about. They weren't talking about wanting to go join a horror show in which people were beheaded, but wanting to go somewhere where they felt like they would fit, where they were included. What was the role of women once they arrived in the Islamic State, and how were they instrumental in the establishment and growth of this organization? 
Um, I should say really quickly that for the women who went from the Arab world, um, and not just the Arab world, from the Muslim world in, in the Middle East and beyond, um, you know, the context for going was very much, I think, reflective of the despair that many Middle Eastern societies found themselves in in the wake of the Arab Spring. Um, I think we all followed the kind of heady days where it seemed like there was a really hopeful chance for change in a lot of countries, whether it was Tunisia or Libya or Syria, uh, Bahrain, Yemen. Um, all of those very hopeful moments largely um, kind of collapsed into greater repression civil war. And it was in that aftermath um, and in those protests, I think maybe you all remember, um, women were really at the forefront of those uprisings. They were there at the protests. They were the one galvanizing the men. Um, and when all of that hope kind of society to society from Egypt uh, to, to Libya to Syria, when all of that hope collapsed, ISIS, as a kind of militant force, really moved in and approached and targeted women specifically, kind of seeing that women had emerged as this social force and you know, preying on that really skillfully. Um, so I think that's really kind of crucial to understanding um, the way that kind of gender and militancy interacted in the rise of ISIS. And also, you know, it reached out to women um, in such a focused way, in ways that I think a lot of their governments, even at the time, were not you know, heeding women. Um, so a promise to, to women to be able to come and work in this pious, utopian society that they could have jobs as doctors or graphic artists or whatever they were, they could do that freely. Um, I write about a young woman called Noor from Tunisia, um, and I start the book with her because um, I felt that she kind of, she, her story kind of crystallized why for a lot of women um, who didn't feel included in their societies, nor grew up in a Tunisia that was very authoritarian. Um, and it seemed to include women, but only secular women. So if you wore a headscarf in the Tunisia that Noor grew up in, you couldn't go to university, you couldn't go to high school, you couldn't hold public office. So it was inclusive of a certain type of woman. Um, and Noor went to her high school one day as a 13-year-old wearing a headscarf, and she was thrown out of school, and she was assaulted by a teacher, and she ended up dropping out. Um, so in the kind of post-revolution Tunisia, um, in, in, after the, the Jasmine Revolution that kicked off there, there was a sudden space opening for young women like Noor. Um, and that is the kind of milieu that I try and portray in the book is, you know, how could these moments that came about that seemed so full of hope and opportunity for women, how did they collapse into darkness in a, in a kind of context where a group like this um, that offered such a perverse idea of empowerment for women could have persuaded intelligent young women to go join? On that note, what advice would you give to governments, both Middle Eastern and Western, to prevent a resurgence of ISIS and engage with women? Um, in, a, in a proper way? Uh, it's a tricky question, and it's something that I was thinking about as I listened to um, the first conversation. Um, you know, I work on gender and conflict, and I, I work in a lot of contexts where women's inclusion in peace treaties, where women's empowerment is really a part of government policy, humanitarian aid policy. Um, and I see it, um, I see it sometimes uh, working to the disadvantage of women, because uh, if, if essentially, a government is enacting a foreign policy that is fiercely kind of anti-feminist, and it's pushing of arms deals or it's propping up of dictators that are not inclusive, there's really no way to be able to bring women to the forefront in a meaningful way when the structures that kind of hold them down are so firmly in place. Um, I think we see the lessons in um, kind of staying out of a society's way. I mean, that's kind of my reflection after years of working on this is that a woman's Women's evolution in a society, whether it's a Middle Eastern one or an Asian one or a European one, is essentially going to be a long and complicated internal process. And the more that there is pressure and um, kind of a sense that this is being advanced as a Western agenda ends up working, in my experience, the detriment of women, because they are then facing kind of entrenched patriarchy within their own society that is holding them back. Um, and those forces then portray women's empowerment as a tool of kind of whatever else, you know, whatever kind of um, Western arms, political, you know, manipulative agenda that society perceives itself being on the receiving end of. So I think it compl complicates uh, the struggle for women. 
Did all the women you profiled in your book regret their decision to join the Islamic State? If so, why? And when did they realize that? Nearly all of them regretted it very bitterly and very quickly. Um, I think so many of them, you know, got there, uh, married very quickly. Um, in the story of the three girls from London, um, and in the stories of so many of those women, um, very often their husbands, who were ISIS fighters, were killed, you know, within weeks or months of, of them getting married, uh, and women were forced to remarry, to marry over and over again. Um, and in the interim period, they were housed in these guest houses, which is what the, the title of the book um, kind of alludes to. Uh, so, so many of them became traumatized, I think, by living in this endless cycle. I mean, rather than a life of dignity in a you know, pious society that was, that was supposed to um, mend and address all of the grievances of whatever home country they left behind, it became a kind of horrific, um, a horrific reality that they were trapped in. And when they tried to escape, many of them were in prison. They had their children taken away from them. Um, so I think for the vast majority, it was you know, a shattering reality that they encountered very quickly. In late June, you visited northeast Syria, um, and one of the places you visited was the Al Hol refugee camp, where about 73,000, mostly women and children, are currently being held. Um, you interviewed many of those women who formerly lived in the Islamic State. What did you learn from them while you were there? Um, so this is a camp in, as you said, the northeast of Syria, uh, which is a part of Syria that is no longer in the hands of the Syrian government, um, you know, that's kind of controlled by the United States-led coalition and some Syrian Kurdish forces. Um, essentially, uh, there's, a, there's a massive population living um, in, in prison detention camps. I mean, 60% of that camp is under the age of 12. So in many ways, it's kind of a child detention center. Um, it's, it's absolutely a, a devastating place. Um, so many of these women, especially from Western countries, are, are desperate to come home. Um, they realize that they need to be prosecuted. They realize that they need to be accountable for the decisions that they made, but they're, um, they're desperate to still be treated as citizens. Um, you know, I think over 300, 400 children have died in this camp just in the last six months. Um, the conditions are really unimaginable. Um, children running feral everywhere and disease rampant, um, you know, tents getting burned down. Um, there are a number of women in those camps who are still quite, device, d quite devout, hardline ISIS supporters, and they terrorize the other women and the children. Um, so really, it's a situation where victims of ISIS are being held together with adherents of, of, of ISIS. Um, and I think it's really worth remarking that the US has been um, kind of exceptionally uh, high-minded and, and taking the right path when it comes to these women. It's really been urging other countries to repatriate them, um, not to give them a free pass, but prosecute them, you know, see what evidence there is against them. If there's none, you know, try and rehabilitate. Um, European governments haven't been so progressive. They're kind of abandoning these women to their fate. And for our final question, what does the future hold for these women who were associated with the Islamic State? Um, Again, it really varies, uh, I think, country to country. Um, I think Europe is a place, especially now, and I think the US um, can, can, uh, is, is a parallel in a lot of ways. Uh, the rise of far-right populist nationalism in Europe um, makes this issue a kind of issue of domestic politics. It's not simply, shall we rehabilitate and prosecute according to the rule of law of our country, um, but it becomes something that the far-right uses against kind of centrist or, or leftist political forces. Um, so it's not really something that um, I think is being decided in courts um, according to the rule of law even, but it's a matter of politics. Um, and I think really the danger is repeating the cycle of exclusion that ISIS uh, kind of preyed upon uh, so skillfully. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of Muslims in Europe and in this country are watching whether these many of them, very young women, um, are treated as citizens in that they have the right to be prosecuted rather than abandoned. And they have the right, and it seems, um, 
you know, it's hard to think of it as a right, but the right to have the rule of law applied to you, even, even in terms of punishment for your wrongdoing. Um, so I think that's the kind of um, the moment that we're at, is, is to see whether we can reflect on some of the lessons of this experience and, and, and try and understand why so many thousands of women would march across, leave their homes, leave their parents, leave their schools um, to join such a movement. And, to think about you know, what might have motivated them to do that. And in so many ways, if they were very young women looking for a pathway to something better, should we not try and think about what that was um, so that it doesn't happen again? Well, thank you so much again. I hope everyone will pick up a copy of Guest House for Young Widows. And please join me in thanking Azadeh Mouveng. <laughs> <laughs>